So I apologize for my English name. We will speak about uh, the violence of the image and the violence done to the image. Uh, at first, uh, we will point at three forms of violence. The primary form is that of aggression, of oppression, of rape and uh, spoiling. The unilateral violence of the most powerful. Another form is that of the historical, of critical violence. The violence of the negative and the transgression of revolt and revolution. Including maybe the violence of analysis and the interpretation. Both are determined forms of violence. Effects that are related to specific causes and to whatever form of transcendence, be it that of power, of history, or of meaning. These are, I would say, the violence of a first type and of a second type. But now we have to deal with the violence of a third type, a very different one, more radical and subtle, the violence of deterrence, of consensus and control, of hyperregulation and irregulation together. The violence of the virtual, a meta-violence in some way. A violence of forced consensus and interaction, which are like the plastic surgery of the social. Therapeutic, genetic, communicational and informational violence. But first of all, the violence of transparency, which tend to eradicate as a way of prophylaxis, of physical and mental regulation, the very roots of evil, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is death itself. Violence of a general extradition of conflict, of death, violence which paradoxically puts an end to the violence itself, and which therefore cannot be balanced except with radical denegation, with pure apprehension to the whole state of things, a pure violence without object anymore, without determination. This is a typical violence of information, of media, of images, of the spectacular, connected to a total visibility, a total elimination of secrecy, be it of a psychological or mental, or of a neurological, biological or genetic order, soon we shall discover the chain of revolt, the center of violence in the brain, perhaps even the chain of resistance against genetic manipulation. Biological brainwashing, brainstorming, brain lifting, with nothing left but recycled, whitewashed, lobotomized people, as in uh, clockwork orange. At this point, we should not speak of violence anymore, but rather of uh, violence, inasmuch that it does not work frontally, me mechanically, by, but by contiguity, by contamination, along chain reactions, breaking our secret immunities, and operating not just by a negative effect, like the classical violence, but on the contrary by an excess of the positive, just as a cancer cell proliferates by metastasis, by restless reproduction, and an excess of vitality. That is the point in the controversy about the violence of the screens and the impact of images on people's minds. The fact is, that the medium itself has a neutralizing power, counterbalancing the direct effect of the violence on the imagination. I would say, the violence of a third type annihilates the violence of a first and second type, but at the price of a more violent intrusion in the deep cells of our mental world. The same as for antibiotics. They eradicate the agents of disease by reducing the general level of vitality. When the medium becomes a message, that's Maclean, of course, 
then violence as a medium becomes its own message, a messenger of itself. So the violence of a message cannot be compared with the violence of the medium as such, with the violence emanating from the confusion between medium and message. It is the same with viruses. The virus also is information, but of a very special kind. It is medium and message, agent and action at the same time. This is, that is the very origin of its violence, of its uncontrollable proliferation. In fact, in all actual biological, social or mental processes, violence has substituted uh, violence. The traditional violence of alienation, of power and oppression has been superated by something more violent than violence itself, the violence, the violence. And while it was an historical and uh, individual subject of violence, there is no subject, no personal agent of violence, of contamination, of chain reaction, and then no possibility to confront it efficiently. The classical violence was still haunted by the specter of the evil. It was still visible. Violence only trans appears. It is of the order of transparency, and its logic is that of the transparency of the evil. The image, and more generally the sphere of information, is violent because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Everything must be seen, must be visible, and the image is the site par excellence of its visibility. But at the same time, it's the site of its disappearance. And that something in it has disappeared, has returned to nowhere, makes the very fascination of the image. Particularly in the case of all professional images, of press images, which testify of real events. In making the reality, even the most violent, emerge to the visible, it makes the real substance disappear. It's like the myth of the early days, when Orpheus turns around to look at her, she vanishes and returns to hell. That is why the more exponential the marketing of images is growing, the more fantastic, <coughs> uh, the more fantastically grows the indifference towards the real world. Finally, the real world becomes a useless function, a collection of phantom shapes and ghost events. We are not far from the silhouettes on the walls of the cave of Plato. A wonderful model for this uh, forced visibility was a big brother and all similar programs, uh, reality shows, uh, docu soaps, and so on. Just there, just there, where everything is given to be seen, there is nothing left to be seen. It is the mirror of platitude, of banality, of the zero degree of everyday life. There is a place of a fake sociality a virtual sociality where the other is disparately out of reach. This very fact illuminating perhaps the fundamental truth that the human being is not, perhaps not, a social being. Moreover, in all these scenarios, the televisual public is mobilized as a spectator and judged. It has become itself Big Brother. The power of control and transvisuality has shifted to the silent majorities themselves. We are far beyond the panopticon, the famous panopticon, where there was still a source of power and visibility. <coughs> it was so, <coughs> so to say, a panexopticon. Things were made visible to an external eye. Whereas here, these new forms, they are made transparent to themselves, a panendoptical, thus erasing the traces of control and making the 
operator himself transparent. The power of control is internalized, so to say, and people are no more victims of the image. They transform themselves into images. They only exist as screens or in a superficial dimension. All that is visualized there is the in the operation Big Brother and so and others is pure virtual reality, a synthetic image of the banality produced as in a computer, the equivalent of a ready-made, a given transcription of everyday life, which is in itself already cycled by all current patterns. The question is, is there an sexual voyeurism? Not at all. Almost no sexual scenery. But people don't want that. What they secretly want to see is a spectacle of the banality, which is from now our real pornography, our true obscenity, that of the nullity of insignificance and platitude. That would be the extreme reverse of the theater of the cruelty by Artaud. But maybe in that scene lies a certain form of cruelty too, at least of a virtual one, at the same, at the time when media and television are more and more unable to give an image of the events of the world, then they discover the everyday life, the existential banality as the most criminal event as the most violent inactuality, as the very place of the perfect crime. And what it is, really. And people are fascinated, terrified, and fascinated, at the same time, by this indifference of the nothing to see, of the nothing to say, by the indifference of their own life, as of the zero degree of living. The banality and the consumption of banality have now become an Olympic discipline of our time, the last form of the experiences of the elites. In fact, this deals with the naive impulsion to be nothing and to comfort oneself in this nothingness, sanctioned by the right to be nothing and to be considered and respected as such. Something like a struggle for nothing and for virtual days, the perfect opposite to the basic anthropological postulate of a struggle for life. At least it seems that we are all about to change our basic humanistic goals. There are two ways of disappearing, of being nothing. In the integral reality, everything must logically want to disappear, automatic ad reaction to the overdose of reality. There are two ways, either to be hidden and to insist on the right not to be seen, that's the actual defense of private life, or one shifts to a delirious exhibitionism of his own platitude and insignificance. The ultimate protection against the servitude of being and of being himself. Hence, the absolute obligation to be seen, to make oneself visible at any price. Everyone deals on both levels at the same time. Then we are in a double bind, not to be seen and to be continuously visible. No ethics, no legislation can solve this dilemma and the whole current polemic about the right to information, all of this polemic is useless. Maximal information, maximal visibility are now part of the human rights and of human duties, all the same. And the destiny of the image is trapped between the unconditional right to, be see, to see and that unconditional as well not to be seen. This means uh, that people as are decipherable at every moment, overexposed to the light of information and addicted to their own image, driven to express themselves at any time. Self-expression is the 
as the ultimate form of confession, uh, as Foucault said. To become an image, one has to give a visual object of the, his whole everyday life, of his possibilities, of his feelings and desires. He has to keep no secrets and to interact permanently. Just here is the deepest violence, a violence down to the deepest core, to the heart core of, in the, of the individual, and at the same time to the language, because it's also the language loses its symbolic originality, being nothing more than the operator of visibility. It loses its ironic dimension, its conceptual distance, its autonomous dimension, where language is more important than what it signifies. The image, too, is more important than what it speaks of. That we forget, usually, again and again. And that is the source of the violence done to the image. Today, everything takes the look of the image. Then all pretend that the real has disappeared under the pressure and the profusion of images. What is totally neglected and forgotten is that the image also disappears under the blow and the impact of reality. The image is usually spoiled of its own existence as image, devoted to a shameful complicity with the real. The violence exercised by the image is largely balanced by the violence done to the image. Its exploitation as a pure vector of documentation, of testimony, of message, including the message of misery and violence, its allegiance to moral, to pedagogy, to politics, to publicity. <clears throat> then, the magic of the image, both as fatal and as vital illusion, is fading away. The Byzantine iconoclasts wanted to destroy images in order to abolish meaning and the representation of God. Today we are still iconoclasts, but in an opposite way. We kill the images by an overdose of meaning. Borges' fable on the people of the mirror uh, is an illustration. He gives the hypothesis that behind each figure of resemblance and representation, there is a vanquished enemy, a defeated singularity a dead object. And the iconoclasts clearly understood how icons were the best way of letting God disappear. But perhaps God himself had chosen to disappear behind the images in nobody knows. Anyway, today is no more the matter of God. We disappear behind our images. No chance anymore that our images are stolen from us, that we must give up our secrets, because we no longer have any. That is at the same time the sign of our ultimate morality and of our total obsolete. There is a deep uh, misunderstanding of the process of meaning. Most images and photographs today reflect the misery and the violence of human condition. But all this affects us less and less just because it is oversignified. In order for the meaning, for the message to affect us, the image has to exist on its own, to impose its original language. In order for the real to be transferred to our imagination, and our, or our imagination transferred to the real, it must be a counter-transference upon the image, and this counter-transference has to be resoluted, resolved, in terms of the psychoanalysis. Today, we see misery and violence becoming a leitmotiv of publicity, just by the way of images. Toscani, for example, is reintegrating sex and AIDS, war and death, into fashion. And why not? Jubilating at images, 
are no less obscene than the pessimistic ones, but at one condition, to show the violence of publicity itself, the violence of fashion, the violence of the medium, what actually publishers are not even to try to do. However, fashion and high society are themselves a kind of spectacle of days. The world's misery is quite so visible, quite so transparent, in the line of the face of any top model as in the skeletal body of an African boy. The same cruelty is to be perceived everywhere if one only knows how to look at it. This realistic image, however, does not catch at all what really is, but what should not be, death and misery, what should not exist from our moral and humanistic point of view, and at the same time making an aesthetic and commercial perfectly immoral use and abuse of this misery. Images that actually testify behind their pretended objective of a deep denial of the real and of an equal denial of the image, a sign to present what does not even want to be represented, a sign to the rape of the real by burglary. Murder of the image, crushed by other information, other signification, other reference. Murder of the secret of the image, drawn by hypervisibility by unconditional transparency. In a film in uh, Living Las Vegas, uh, we look in a scene at a very charming blonde girl pissing and talking and then on, perfectly indifferent to what she is saying and doing. A perfectly useless scenery, but which ostensibly testifies that nothing will escape from the mixing, mixture of the fiction and the reality, but that all is assigned to a ready to see, ready to act, ready to enjoy. That is transparency, to force all the real in the orbit of the visual, not even representation, pure visuality. And this is obscene. Obscene is all what is unnecessarily visible, without desire and without effect or what usurps the so rare and so precious space of appearance. The last violence done to the image, the very final violence, is the technological one. Electronic and computerized synthetic images issued from numerical combination, combined and reworked on the surface of a screen. It is the end of the imagination of the image itself, of its fundamental illusion, because in the synthetic operation the referent no longer exists and the real has not even time to take place, as it is immediately produced as virtual reality. No direct capture of the picture anymore, no presence of a real <coughs> object in an irrevocable moment and face to face, which constitutes the magic of the photography, for example, and of the image generally as acting as a singular event. Last glimmer of reality in a world devoted to hyper reality. Nothing left in the synthetic image of this punctual exactitude, of this punctum as Roland Barthes say, uh, this punctum in time, which is characteristic of the analogous image. While the photo, according to Roland Barthes, testify of an absence that something really took place but now went away forever, today the photo, the genuine analogous photograph, would rather testify of a presence of an immediate presence of a subject to the object, what does not happen anymore in the computerizing of images. Ultimate challenge to the synthetic order which is now overwhelming us. The relation of the image to its reference 
raised already a lot of problems, both of representation, but when the referent is out of the field, and there is actually no representation anymore, when the real object has disappeared into the technical programming of the image, when the image as pure artifact does not reflect anyone or anything, and does not even go through the phase of the negative, can we still speak of an image? Are in fact televisual, numerical and virtual images are the images at all? Our real world of images will soon cease to exist and our consumption of images itself will be virtual. If the image, as Plato says, is the confluence of the light emanating from the object and of the light emanating from the eye, then we will soon neither have an object nor an eye, and there's no images anymore. Uh, the same problem is for thinking. In the field of artificial intelligence, the thought does not even have time to formulate itself. Maybe the computerization of the image is the perfect mode of the image, and just the same, the computerization of thought, artificial intelligence, would be the achievement of thinking. But just because of this, it is at the same time the total denigration. In the very perfection lies the violence of synthetic images and artificial intelligence. A perfect exercise, exorcism of the real as an infant malady of virtuality. And just the same, a perfect exorcism of thought as infant malady of brain engineering. And the perfect exorcism of the image as infant malady of the visuality. That's a bad fate for the image and for thinking and for the real in general. But at the same time, the chance for the genuine photographic image of a pathetic success as it happens now of an artificial resurrection, as for an animal species about to disappear. Maybe it is in this symbolic murder of the image an ironical revenge for the murder of the real by the image. The whole dimension of technical, economical and aesthetic values, fashion, market and speculation are droning the image under the fluid. The specificity of the image is that it is in some way a parallel universe, another world, another scene, in two dimensions, not to confuse with our universe in three dimensions, our real universe, a world of representation. This dimension less makes its magic and its power of illusion. All what reintegrates the image in the third dimension third dimension is a potential violence done to the image. Not only the special dimension of relief and stereoscopy, relief in the stereoscopy, but even that of movement, of time in the movie, or that of meaning and message, all that reintegrate the image in our world and destroy it as a parallel world. Even worse is the absorption of the image in what we would call the false dimension, that of the virtual and the cybernetics. We usually believe that every additional dimension is a plus, but on the contrary, every additional dimension annihilates the former ones in their singularity. The third one annihilates the, the two-dimensional world, that of the image. As for the fourth one, it annihilates all the other, including the three-dimensional world of representation. It's a strange game. The new world, the brave new world of the virtual, is a world of integral reality. As a world of integral reality, and a world of integral reality has no place for a parallel universe like that of the image, then here is the final solution for image and imagination. 
Something else very dangerous for the image as a parallel universe is the fact that our whole actual universe itself is becoming image. We have to do with a general conversion of our real world in image, the most vulgar form of visibility. And then, how is any parallel universe to be distinguished at all? How can the image save its singularity in a world entirely turned into image? Now, the question, the crucial question is, uh, is there still a chance, a real chance for the image to escape this double violence, the one it exerts and the one it endures, in order to find the original power of the image again? the evil genius of the image. Images that resist the violence of information and communication to recover beyond all signification and aesthetic value the pure even of the image. Resist the noise, the perpetual rumor of the world through the silence of the image. Resist movement, flow and acceleration through the stillness of the image. Resist the moral imperative of meaning through the silence of signification. And above all, resist this automatic overflow of images and their perpetual succession. Recover the pregnant detail of the object, the punctum, but also the moment of acting, of taking the picture immediately past and always nostalgic. Opposite to the flow of images produced in real time, indifferent to this other dimension of the becoming image of the object, the time itself. The visual flux of actuality does not know anything but change. It does not know the concept of becoming, which is radically different from change. In this flux, the image does not even have time to become image as in the sphere of information, thought, or even as out of a chance to becoming thought. In order for the image and for the object to emerge as such, it has to be put in suspense, in suspense of meaning, in suspense of a tumultuous operation of the world. It must be captured in a single fantastic moment, which is the first encounter, the surprising moment, when things are not yet aware that we are here, and when they have not yet been arranged by analytical order, when our absence is not yet fading away. But this instant is ephemeral. We should not, we should not be present to see it. And that does, in a sense, the photographer, hidden behind his lens, himself vanishing, himself disappearing. For this is the price of making objects appear. The price is the disappearance of a subject. In this rule of disappearance and transparency as a secret rule of the image, this one has a close connection to theory. It is the silent consecration of all that which, having achieved itself in the discourse, must now metamorphose itself in something else. And the image is the most beautiful of the metamorphoses of a discourse. It has basically nothing to do with it, but it is as if it had preceded it in an earlier life. In a way, the theory itself, when it reaches its extreme limit, has no open face anymore. It becomes its own mask. It keeps the outlook of analysis, but it has secretly transfused to the other side, to the side of the phenomena, of which there is nothing to say anymore. In this moment, the image appears with all its phenomenological power, with phenomenal power. The photographic image is born out of this phenomenal intuition of the world, following the analytical intuition. Not as transcription, but as transmutation of theory. That is, at least by your own experience of a photographic image as a trans-theoretical object. 
not as an artistic or realistic activity, but as a becoming image of the object, as becoming image of the soul, a symbolic terminal for the analytic process, together with its resolution into an object existing for, for its own, neither real nor objective. As soon as it, as it becomes an image, the object raises no problems anymore. It is the immediate solution to what is perfectly insoluble from the point of view of analysis. So it would be mutation, metamorphosis, anamorphosis maybe, poetic transference of the analytical situation. The punctum, which is at the core of the image, becomes then the contrapunctum of the theory. I